Please join me in welcoming James. So, some of you may like your job. I love my job. I have the best job in the world. For the last 15 years, I have done nothing but work with innovators, uh, entrepreneurs, founders, dreamers, aspiring individuals who think they have some big idea that could change the world, or at least make a few more dollars for themselves and afford to live in the place they live, such as Queenstown. Startup, what does it mean? The first thing I always look at with is what's the term startup? It means a lot of different things to different people. For some folks, the uh, concept of a startup is the action or process of setting something in motion, right? It's, it's the idea of getting going. Um, of starting a new business. But I think when I talk about the word start to folks, it actually means something different. It's a state of mind. It's the ability to um, think quickly, to pivot, quickly adapt, to fail, to move on to opportunity in a quick way. I see it as an attitude, as running business in the context of testing everything, failing fast, that nothing is precious. The biggest mistake I see when I work in the B2B space with companies trying to be innovative, this term of entrepreneurship, of being an entrepreneur but inside an organization, is that too often we're caught up in the standards of the way we do things. And at a startup, the last thing we think about is the way we do things, because we usually don't even know. We're doing it on the fly, we're winging it, we're trying to figure it out. And honestly, in many ways, that ability to compact ourselves into the way we do things is what holds most businesses back from being innovative. To think like a startup means more than just that. I'm going to cover five of my favorite lessons. I could spend like an entire day talking about ways to think like a startup. I'm going to pick five. And let's just start with the business model because I think this is the one that most people uh, don't think too much about, but uh, is very critical. So raise your hand real quick if you have a written business plan for your business that's actually current. Wow, how thick is it? Pages? Pages? Some of you? All right, so most of the time, business plans are really for the bank or for investing, right? As, as, as entrepreneurs, as founders, we, we tend not to think of the business plan as some guidebook we need to look at on a regular basis. But I wager that the business plan isn't of itself the most important asset organization you can have for what the strategy of the organization is and what you're doing and why. So when we see new entrepreneurs come in about thinking about new ideas that want to launch, the first thing I ask is, tell me about your business model. And what they think is, what am I selling, what my product is, what problem I'm solving. They actually think about what the actual business model is. And there's this amazing tool that each of you can use called the Lean Canvas. It was designed to make the idea of putting your entire business model on paper very, very simple. This is your first free tool you get to use coming out today's session. Right? Here's the thing about Lean Canvas. Lean Canvas is about, in very simple terms, putting who you're, what problem you're solving, who the customer is, what your unique value proposition is, what solution solves those problems for that customer in a unique way, how do we differentiate ourselves from the existing alternatives. All those things are fundamental to what Lean Canvas does. <coughs> Lean Canvas literally is on one sheet of paper. It can take as little as 15 minutes to fill out completely in its entirety and be accurate for your business. Why is this such a useful tool? Because in large organizations, or even long-lasting long organizations, mature organizations, we tend to hold the knowledge of what we're doing and why at the top echelon, our management team, if, if not just the owner. And what a huge mistake that is, because in a startup, you need everyone to know the why of what we're doing, the what we're doing, the how we're doing it. How many of you have hired a marketing agency or an ad agency or some contractor who's special work for you? And the first thing you want to do is due diligence. How, what do you guys do? Explain to me your business model, how you work. And you have to like spend hours explaining to them. If you have the lean canvas filled out and up to date, which literally takes minutes, you can just hand it to them. In moments, they can read through and understand exactly who you serve, how you make money, where your costs are, what your unique value process is, what makes you do what you do. It's a very simple tool, and I want everyone to fill in these out because for me, there's no better tool out there for explaining what the business model is. Now, let's talk about talent hiring. Now, we could spend a whole day on that alone, right? How do you find the right people? Think about your organization. When we hire, we prioritize. If you think you hire focus on talent potential, raise your hand. As an organization, what do you think? Okay? Now, those of you who think we hire both focus on skills and experience, raise your hand. And when you talk to HR folks, they almost always say what we're required to do is talk about skills and experience. So I wonder for those of you who said A, 
if the person who's doing the vetting of who your talent the potential is to come in the door and join the team is also doing that? Are they, or are they looking at resumes and experiences and where someone worked at? Or are they using tools and techniques to actually evaluate, does the person have the skills and the potential and the energy and the grit to actually bring impact to the organization? Most companies try to fill voids. We need someone who can do customer service. We need someone who can do sales. We need someone who can be a guide. We need someone who can handle logistics. So we'll look at that talent set. And oftentimes, we eliminate the potential of looking at the skills they have. At a startup, everyone has to do everything. The best startup teams don't focus on roles. They focus on skill sets and capabilities and determination and oomph. It's a technical term, by the way. You can look it up. Great startups have people who never say, it's not my job, that's not my job description. Everyone's job description in some ways really is, this is the main thing you do, and everything else is as, as assigned or as you volunteer to do. <coughs> because you're trying to make the big mission happen, which is why we're going to talk about goals next. For me, one of the things that I think is most important is looking for people who see themselves in multiple roles, multiple capabilities. When I interview, for any company that I'm trying to hire for, the first thing I ask is, tell me about all the different types of jobs you could do if you had a choice. It's a very powerful question, because when you start to identify with individuals, it's not just what their experiences are, but also what their aspirations are. And one of the most important components of a startup's hiring methodology is finding people who actually aspire to make an impact in the world that we're trying to, to, to create business opportunity in. If, uh, if I'm in the business of shipping things, and someone's never shipped their stuff anywhere, and we're trying to hire people to be in our shipping logistics business, they've never had to ship something, they've never had a pain, they've never had an issue around it, and their interest is really in food, and being a food eater, <coughs> do I want to hire that person? Maybe, they might have all the right logistics skills, but if they don't have the passion and the interest that goes with it, they're probably not going to stick with me long term. The other thing is, as an entrepreneur, I'm looking for other entrepreneurs. What I find is that if you can find individuals who have some aspiration to start their own business, they're going to be engaged in the business the entire time thinking about how can I do things, what can I learn from here, right? It's a mindset. Um, one of my favorite questions to ask in hiring is, if, you could, if I could give you uh, some venture capital, money, some seed capital, and you could start your own business, what would you start and what makes you think you would be successful at it? That question for any organization with 1,000 employees or 50 employees is extremely useful in understanding what people have as a goal long term and also their capacity to think bigger than what their skill sets and their job requirements have been in the past. It's an amazing way to find talent. So let's talk about that goal setting. Um, for me, I think that I want to know real quick, raise your hand if you have clearly, clearly communicated the organization's goals to the entire team. You can set anybody on your team to walk up here on stage and tell us your current goals. Anybody? Yeah, I like the confidence. All right. One, two. Okay, good. The truth of the matter is, in most organizations, again, we hold at the top. We hold to the leadership team. We just tell our employees, here's what you need to know. It's on a need-to-know basis. Right? At a startup, everybody needs to know everything. You don't even know what we're doing half the time. Right? So we need everybody to know what's going on so someone can raise the red flag when we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't go this direction. We should go that direction. There's a really good technique, a management methodology, called Vital Few Objectives, the BFOs. In Vital Few Objectives, in an in a, in a older organization, a more mature organization, the BFOs might be established on an annual basis during your strategic planning process for the coming year. Typically, those BFOs are headline billboard statements, seven to 10 words, no more than three, of the organizational objectives we have to accomplish in the next period of time, typically 12 months, to achieve whatever we're gonna to do to impact the bottom line, right? or to make the company improve in whatever way we need to improve. Making it get down to three simple, distilled, focused objectives enables a large, mature, even a small, mature organization to communicate in a very broad sense of the way why we're doing what we're doing. And it also creates accountability amongst your employees uh, and your management team around when we make decisions, does it fit to the three VFOs that we've announced? At startups, we tend to have VFOs that change every quarter <laughs> because we're just trying, we're moving, we're so nimble, we're trying to make things happen on a regular basis. 
But that technique of understanding what the priorities are empowers your employees to be managers without having to have a title or the pay rate. Because you can say, here are the three things we have to do. If we don't do these three things, we will not move the needle in the direction we want. And if we don't do things that align with those three, you need to wave the arms and say, hey, wait, does this match up? If it doesn't, it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but it means we should be reevaluated. And you notice down below the girls writing, my goals are, if you give people individual goals around what their role is in the greater scheme of those three VFOs, those three vital few objectives, now they understand how they play a part in the bigger picture. Trent, since I see this at the front, can I use your business as an example? On the fly, we'll see if this works. All right, okay. So, you know, uh, Ziptrek Eco Tours has a strong desire to communicate sustainability story within the community and people learn about the environment that they're visiting while they travel through the trees, right? And if we're getting feedback from the organization that we're not really leaving with a story that's compelling or worth telling others, that meets off the mission that we have of being a, an eco story, not just an adventure activity, right? So if we're collecting data that tells our, from our customers after the fact, consistently that they don't have a story they can go retell to the market. That doesn't mean that the tour guides are doing a poor job. It doesn't mean the science, it's the marketing person designed each of the stops is bad. It doesn't mean that the management team isn't doing their job. It means that we haven't found the right way to deliver a story that our customers want to take to the world that then translates into the brand that they're wanting to exhibit. If the VFO is we want to give customers the ability to tell our, an eco story, a, a, a sustainability story, after they leave, now, in the next year, every person, if you're a guy, you know what you're going to be focusing on. If you're the person who signs, you know what you're focusing on. If you're the person who has the website or the marketing emails, you know part of what your job is to make sure that vital objective happens over the next 12 months. And everyone can align to their specific focus. VFO is like secret sauce for any kind of business because it very simply, very quickly, Gives the entire organization purpose and clarity without a lot of paperwork. In most organizations that I work in, I try to keep the VFOs on the wall somewhere very clear. These are things. And in fact, usually, it's not right this moment, but usually if you have my laptop, my, my desktop has the VFOs of what I'm working on in the, on the, as the desktop background. Like they're in front of me all the time. It's like my constant reminder of doing what I'm supposed to be doing. We tend to think about projects in the waterfall sense. So I'm going to use a software term, waterfall. What waterfall means in software development is we will come up with some product, some solution. We'll come up with 100 features that we need to have. We go to our team and we say, I need these 100 features in the software. Can you do all these things? And they say, yes, we can do it in six months. Perfect. Six months from today, I'll come back to you and the software will be delivered. Awesome. Right? Waterfall. Lots and lots of delivery finally finished off. The problem with waterfall across the board is that in that six months of time, lots of things change. So there's, some, there's some methodologies that make it easier to manage. We're going to talk about Agile, and we're going to talk about Kanban. There's two concepts. I'm going to try to merge a little bit together so you get an idea of how this can work. First of all, who here actually has a documented, real process task management tool that your company uses? Okay. How many here use like just handwritten notes and like the whiteboard? All of those. How many here use like have things written on the back of their hand right now? <laughs> I know at least one person does, I saw it. No, no, you don't believe. Okay. Um, so having some simple tool does not have to mean buying extensive software. There's tons of project management software tools that you probably see ads for them all the time. You're probably berated with those as a business owner. Use my project management tool. Use my project management tool. And there's lots of great tools. I'm going to give you one that you literally can use with just a whiteboard. Or if you want, you can put it in a Google Doc. All right? It's the easiest possible, lowest cost solution. First thing, okay, Kanban. So this is like Toyota methodology on how you manage projects. So this is going to be overly simplified. So anybody here is like an expert in this stuff, please do not shoot me, right? So the basic function, we're going to stick to the far side of the board, is that you have the things that you're doing, right? You have, you have things that you need to, be, need to do, just line item, it's a post-it note, what we're going to do, sticky note. You have things that are currently being worked on, and you have the things that are, that are done, right? And then you also have things that are help. So the reason it's color-coded is just to represent the idea that maybe different teams or different individuals in your organizations are responsible for those things. So, oh, it's more related to Bob. So Bob's going to get all the blue sticky notes, and James is going to do all the, the yellow ones, and Jill's going to do all the, the red ones. The idea is that 
in a very simple format. On, you can do it in a whiteboard. You can just do it on the wall, right? You can write the marker to do uh, doing and done. In a very clear way, everyone can see exactly what has not been touched, what's in some form of action, and what's actually been complete. And complete means completely done, not like 90% done. It's like I'm signed off on it, I did what I was supposed to do, we're cool. And the best thing is, this is a secret one here, is help. We use this to start a weekend a lot, so our mentors are wandering by the table. They can go, oh, okay, they need help on this topic, and we look at it, and then we go find the right person to help out. But it works really great in any organization, because the first thing we have to allow within task assignment is for people to be bombed and say, I can't get it done, or I don't know how, or I need help. Too often, we give people assignments, and we assume that if they don't make a deadline, it's, it's, a, it's a fault. There can be any number of dynamics of why that's happening. Letting people have a safe zone to say, I need help, is like the best thing you can possibly do. And this is not to critique, this is to, to truly aid. Now you notice a couple things on the left side, icebox and backlog. Now these are agile methodology terms that are coming out of software space, but we're applied to all kinds of business. And I'm applying them even now into Kanban because they have a very good purpose. Backlog means things that we know we need to do, but they're not a priority right now. So as a management team or as a group, we might decide what really has to be done, that's in the to-do box, and everything else is backlog. And sometimes backlog has like hundreds and hundreds of post notes. What's interesting is over time, some of those post notes get taken down because business evolves, opportunity changes, staffing talent changes, and we realize those things are not the right fit anymore, so we pull them down. And then there's things that are called in the ice box. That's like stuff like really cool big picture idea, but we are not gonna actually do it, right? We're not gonna do it right now, it's like maybe if like freaking way awesome things happen, and we got like some extra staff, and revenue's flying, we'll pursue that big idea. It's the icebox, right? We don't wanna lose it, but we at least wanna, we don't wanna put it on the priority list. There's another methodology, which is Agile. And in Agile, we do what's called time boxing. So Agile uses what's called sprints, okay? I'm not getting too technical, and anybody here is a Scrum Master, please don't shoot. All right, so keep it simple. Time boxing, my favorite two week time deliverables because sometimes someone's off for a week or a short week, um, there's holidays, two week windows. Every two weeks, we're gonna deliver. My favorite time is Thursday. Thursday at noon is the start and finish of each sprint, okay? It gives everyone a chance to catch up for the middle of the week. You don't have to do things on Fridays because that's always a crazy day for different people for different reasons. And the idea is that you know what's gonna happen exactly in this sprint, you go ahead and determine what's going to happen in the next sprint, the next two weeks, and you forecast what happens in the following sprint. And everything else that needs to be done for the organization is <coughs> off to the side, the backlog, effectively. And this is kind of what it looks like, same general concept. There's a backlog, <coughs> there's an icebox, and backlog's much busier because it's like everything goes over there. You have what's to do. That's physically what needs to be done in this two weeks. By Thursday at noon, it must be complete. You still use color coding or some form of assignment to people. And then you actually have posted what's happening next sprint and the sprint after that. <clears throat> and so as things progress during the sprint, as people complete things, they move it over to the right side. This is the complete slash review. And you might have someone on your team whose job is basically to make sure that when they say it's complete, it's actually complete. Like that might be a manager's job or a supervisor, etc. And then again, we'll go one more slide. You'll see that as things keep moving over, most things we've done in the sprint, Thursday, 11.59 a.m., all right, time for our sprint meeting, our review, okay? And the first thing we're going to do in that meeting is review everything that got completed. And we're going to discuss, did anything come up that was surprising? Was there anything that we should have been doing differently based on what we did in that two-week window? And then you discuss that, and you go, oh man, somebody didn't get one thing done, the thing over there. Well, the first question is, do we still need to do it? Because maybe the dynamics changed and no one did it because the, the marketplace demands changed. We could just pull it off, we could throw it to the backlog, or throw it down to the icebox. And the next thing we do is we shovel everything to the left, and we reevaluate what actually has to be done, and then we forecast for the following three weeks out. The reason this is so effective is because it gives everyone in the organization anticipation of what's coming, but we only commit to what can actually happen during that two-week sprint. So there's no false expectations, and, we, and for big projects, it forces us to break them down into smaller components, <coughs> smaller bites to eat. And it's very valuable because oftentimes market demand changes, business demand changes, and this enables us to move very quickly. There are teams that do three-day sprints, right? Really rapid up change. Weeks common, to me, two weeks is a secret one for most organizations. 
All right, so let's talk about KPIs and measuring. So, we guess again, it's been a whole day on KPIs, measurement. I'm gonna try to keep to my favorite one, okay? And it's one that everybody can use. Uh, what I find most often the case in organizations is the bigger we are, the older we are, the more uh, things we're trying to track and manage. And when you get to a startup, it's typically like one or two big things you gotta deal with. And I think what happens oftentimes when we come with all this data tracking and reporting, and then historically we add to it versus replace, we keep adding more reporting, more reporting, and eventually someone says, all I'm doing is reporting. Oh, it's Thursday at four, I gotta do all my reports by 5 p.m., I hate my life. Right? That's what happens. So one of the things we in a startup is, let's pick the two or three things that are most important. Now I'm gonna suggest that one of them, and I know some people don't like it, but I'm gonna push, push it out there, is Net Promoter Score. To me, what Net Promoter Score does is it just, what is the total satisfaction of our customer base? You can also do Net Promoter Score internally for your staffing satisfaction. Here's how it kind of works. Let me just take real quick this table, okay? Before I explain how it works. Scale of one to 10, one worst presentation so far ever, 10 best ever. Sorry guys, <laughs> What would you give it, real quick? Throw out a number. Nine. Nine? Eight. Eight? Five. Five? Five. Nine? Nine. Nine? Nine. Eight. 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 You, sir, out the door. Go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's how it works. It's all good. Anything six or less is a negative, right? Not three or less, but six or less is just crap. That's bad for business. If you gave me a seven or an eight, it's completely neutral, right? It, it's neither good nor bad. Say, yeah, I got an eight, it feels pretty good. No, eight sucks, okay? Because eight's not positive. Only nines and tens count, okay? And the way you do that, so we had three nines, is that right? Three nines? Okay, so we had three nines out of, I should pick a table with even numbers, I think the math's so much easier, okay? And we had one negative, and you had a couple neutrals, okay? So one of seven, I mean, what's the, and that's that percentage, and then you have three of seven is the other percentage. So let's flip it over to the next slide. It's the percentage of, of those in the positive minus the percentage of the group that is negative. A zero is a completely neutral net promoter score. Anything above zero percent, so we are above zero percent, we're probably around 30, no, 45, I'm guessing, if I did the math, we're about 40, 45 percent. So I got a 45 percent score. 50 or above is considered totally excellent. So I'll take it, I'll totally take it, all right? But by using just this simple measurement, we talk to staff, or to talk to customers, we're able to really quickly gather and understand, are they just happy with this? The concept behind Net Promoter Score is that at the highest level, our customers are willing to tell others that we are good to do business with and they will, which I think is a pretty darn good thing to measure for most companies. Right? It's also a great tool to use for your staff, right? especially those of you who are suffering turnover. And honestly, have them all put in the, in the box their number, one to 10. And if the number goes negative, that tells you something's wrong with culture. And it's a great thing to measure on a <coughs> bi-monthly basis until you get it resolved, okay? Customer-wise, it's an easy email when you send out on a regular basis, what's your number, one through 10. Don't ask any other questions. What is your level of satisfaction with our organization, right? Zero, one to 10. So we've covered business model a little bit. We'll talk about hiring talent. Um, we've talked about setting goals and task management, of course, measuring success. And those are just tidbits, right? I could spend all day on this stuff. I'm gonna give you one more, all right? So one last lesson. You have permission to pull your phones out. Most of you have them somewhere handy, I see that. Okay, I want you to open up an email. Everybody open up, get your phone out, it's all good. Open up your email. All right, so you know, the first thing I want them to do is I want them to send an email to jb at jamesburns.com. That's my email address. I want you to just type that in. There's an E in Burns, so don't get confused there. Okay, otherwise there's no James Burns like in the UK that gets my email. All right, jb at jamesburns.com. And in the subject line, what I'd like you just to put is TLAS. Think like a startup, TLAS, all right? Got that? I want you to answer two questions. You don't have to write the question out. I just want you to write yes or no on two lines. The first question is, do you want to receive a newsletter? So I, I run the Startup Based on Links uh, organization, and we have a newsletter that's happening, what's happening in the startup scene here in the local market. If you'd like to receive it, hit yes. If you don't want to hit it, just type in no, and I won't subscribe to you, all right? The second question I have for you, do you want to summarize this presentation? Yes or no? No obligation otherwise. All right. So it's going to say, to JB James Burns from you, subject TLAS. It's going to say yes and yes, I hope. All right? And then you're going to click send, a little send button there. Send.
listening to that sound. All right? Cool. Now, what was the final lesson, folks? Always be closing. In startups, it's about sales, sales, sales. All right? Pushing your message, getting your market out there, getting leads. And I just did that with 100 of you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, James. Thanks, James. Any questions?